Iranian President Hassan Rouhani has branded the United States as an unreliable country following its withdrawal from the 2015 nuclear deal. Iran has begun major Navy drills in the Strait of Hormuz. U.S. defense officials say dozens of small military boats have been deployed by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in the beginning stages of these exercises. Officials say the boats were deployed for a, quote, swarming operation meant to shut down the strait should a conflict with the United States break out. It is very concerning, absolutely, and we, we've always been very worried about the Straits of Hormuz, but at the same time, it's not as if this is a a new area for uh, unrest and things to worry about, you know, so we'll, although the specifics of the naval exercises are extremely concerning, the reality of the broader picture is, I wouldn't say steady state, but it's like constantly like this. If they do something here, it's going to be not just the U.S. that comes after them. Let's begin here with tensions between the United States and Iran escalating dramatically overnight. It all started early Sunday when Iranian President Rouhani cautioned President Trump about pursuing hostile policies. Rouhani said, quote, America should know that peace with Iran is the mother of all peace and war with Iran is the mother of all wars. Last night he got a response via tweet, of course. President Trump warning Rouhani in all caps, never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Well, it is easy to threaten. It was easy to threaten North Korea, but there is a qualitative difference between what's taking place here in Washington with regard to Iran and what was taking place, still is taking place, with regard to North Korea. Because even when Donald Trump was threatening to rain fire and fury down on the Korean peninsula, his own defense secretary, Jim Mattis, his then secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, they were all saying, look, there is no military option in North Korea. We've got no capacity to take a military uh, option uh, north of the 38th parallel. They do not feel the same, those insiders within the Trump administration, uh, about Iran. And remember that some of those insiders have changed. You've got the more hawkish Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in place now, rather than Rex Tillerson. And, of course, all of this Iran rhetoric is fueled in part by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is very close to President Trump. Iran lied about never having a nuclear weapons program. 100,000 secret files prove that they lied. Second, even after the deal, Iran continued to preserve and expand its nuclear weapons know-how for future use. Why would a terrorist regime hide and meticulously catalog its secret nuclear files if not to use them at a later date. Rouhani says that the U.S. is seen in the world as a country that cannot be trusted due to its lack of commitment to international accords. He made a comment as he was meeting with North Korean Foreign Minister Ri young ho in Tehran. The top Korean diplomat criticized the U.S. pullout and restoration of sanctions on Tehran, saying that the moves are against international law. U.S. President Donald Trump dropped out of the multilateral agreement in May, reimposing sanctions against the Islamic Republic. Smiles and handshakes between the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and North Korea's Foreign Minister Ri Young ho at a Southeast ASEAN security forum. But behind the scenes in Singapore, much debate about a leaked 150-page UN report accusing the North of deceptive practices. The confidential report says Pyongyang is breaking UN sanctions and continuing the development of nuclear bombs and ballistic missile technology. The very first missiles we saw in Iran were simply copies of North Korean missiles. And over the years, uh, we've seen photographs of North Korean and Iranian officials in each other's countries, and we've seen all kinds of common hardware and design approaches. I declare before you that the Islamic Republic of Iran will not be the first country to violate the agreement. It will respond decisively and resolutely to its violation by any party. It will be a great pity if this agreement were to be destroyed by rogue newcomers in the world of politics. The world will have lost a great opportunity, but such unfortunate behavior will never impede Iran's course of progress and advancement. A pretty direct message to the U.S. president yes. there. 
Well, let's make no mistake. By his words uh, and his potential deeds, President Trump is moving the United States closer to war with Iran and away from peace. It's a dangerous activity, and it really is, is un... It, there's no reason for it. There's no reason why the United States would want to pull out of the Iran deal. It's working. Uh, the U.S. military says it's working. U.S. intelligence says it's working. Uh, with a deal that's working that's preventing Iran from moving towards nuclear weapons, the United States should be honoring this deal. If the United States pulls out, what message does that send to other countries that the United States might want to deal mm -hmm. with? For example, North Korea. Here we are trying to reduce the threat in North Korea, trying to negotiate some kind of agreement. Why should the North work with Donald Trump if he's pulling out of agreements left and right? As of today, it is two minutes to midnight. President Trump has issued an executive order reinstating sweeping sanctions on Iran at midnight on Tuesday, months after dropping out of the Iran nuclear deal. I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. If Europe and important countries like Russia and China fill this international vacuum in the deal, perhaps there will be a way to continue. Otherwise, the Islamic Republic of Iran will bring them, the United States, to their sense with its nuclear actions. How do you look on at the president's policy here? Well, I totally agree with it. I'm very grateful for it. I mean, as Bill said, I'm here as chair of a group called United Against Nuclear Iran, a bipartisan group uh, focused really on trying to convince businesses as Congress, including led by people like me and Republicans and Demo Democrats, adopted sanctions, economic pressure on Iran. Yuani, United Against Nuclear Iran, put pressure on businesses to stay out of Iran saying it was risky business and it was wrong to deal with this extremist regime. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani responded, saying Iran couldn't hold talks with the United States while under those sanctions but also acknowledging that they would be willing to talk if the Trump administration is sincere. Exasperation with the mullahs is growing. Protests and sporadic strikes have been disrupting life in more than 80 cities for months right across the Islamic Republic. Today, Trump tweeted that the punitive sanctions will be the most biting ever imposed and that they'll be ratcheting up in November. I am asking for world peace, nothing less, he wrote. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, had dismissed a last-minute offer for negotiations, saying that if someone stands in front of his enemy and sticks a knife in while at the same time seeking talks, they should first put the knife away. He branded this psychological warfare. The bellicose rhetoric between the two countries has been ramped up since Trump reinstated sanctions against the Islamic Republic. Over the weekend, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo once again said that Washington wants other countries to stop importing Iranian oil. The British newspaper, the Daily Express, has this headline, Iran revolution is coming, as 100,000 rush to the streets chanting, death to dictator. Well, there's a headline for you. Joining us now is Don Bremer, a former intelligence officer who knows about this kind of stuff. Do you think there's a chance here that the mullahs will be overthrown by their own people? I think that would be the best thing to happen you, in the situation. Is it going to happen? Eventually, yes. Well, what do you mean eventually? Well, this is, this is a long process, you know. The mullahs have held the people of Iran in a stranglehold for so long. Yeah. And, you know, unless there's a necessity, which that comes generally from the economy. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the lower class, the middle class, the actual people who put this regime in power, they're the ones suffering the most right now. Yes, but they, their economy is collapsing. That's why I'm pressing to know whether or not this revolution, this throwing out of the mullahs, 
is likely to come fairly soon because things seem to be coming to a head. The Iranian economy is doing terribly. Mm. They're about to be hit with more sanctions. They don't have access to dollars, can't play the gold market. And in November, they'll lose access to the oil market. I think things are speeding up there. I think speeding up is the best thing that can happen here. And you say it is collapsing. I say it's collapsed.